Um, so I guess like the other presenters, um, Matt gave us sort of kind of a list of ideas of things that we he wanted wanted us to cover off and talk about today. Um, so this is the list. Sorry, I'm going to have to turn around a bit because I haven't got a screen in front of me. Um, so. Yeah, basically I'm going to talk through each of these sections and then stop and have a good chat and have a discussion to make sure people are on the same page as we're going through. Flip the mic up. Is that a bit better? Okay. Um, so yeah, some of the starting bit is, you know, what's the story with our, our animals shit in the water? So as my kids like to say, I'm one of the few people in the world who have a PhD in cow shit. Um, well, that's true. So that's what I talk about a lot. Um, and I have to say I'm very passionate about my subject I research. Um, then we're talking about what the numbers say in terms of you know, water quality standards and stuff because we know that you know, the farming community and the communities and, and as a whole are getting um, bombarded with lots of data and lots of information. So I'll try and help you sort out some of that, but it's a pretty big topic. Um, and then what that's sort of achievable for um, sheep and beef dominated catchments. If the technology works really well, I'll show you a fun video clip from YouTube as well of some people using, uh, using some water. Um, then we'll finish off with um, you know, some of the current knowledge and tools that you know, we're developing for uh, dealing with, with this issue. So, what do we know about it? I guess one of the key things around animal faeces is it contains a whole lot of different stuff. Uh, nutrients, uh, organic material, other chemicals that are in there, and faecal microbes, I've underlined that because that's my main area I'm going to be talking about today, so we'll go through a lot of that in detail. But there are other you know, issues out there, so in terms of faeces, it contains the nutrients, ammonia and nitrogen um, and phosphorus. Put ammonia in there particularly because it's toxic to fish, so high levels of, of fresh faeces in a river can lead to high levels of ammonia. Um, organic matter, this is um, you know, your cow pats and, and, and sheep pats on the paddock, they just decompose quite happily. Uh, on the paddock and they consume a huge amount of oxygen on the land, that's fine. If this organic material was in the, in the water, um, the microbes in there that use up the organic material, they consume the oxygen. So you lose your DO levels in the, in the um, water, which then impacts on fish life. One of the other things that people often don't think about is sort of other chemicals. If you're putting drenches and antibiotics and those sorts of things into your animals, it's coming out in the faeces as well. Um, so you have to be um, a lot of people don't think about the implications of that, but at the Freshwater Sciences Conference in Invercargill recently, there was um, a river in the US and Texas where they are, fish are exposed to human therapeutic doses of antidepressants because of the amount of sewage discharge that's going into the river. And there's a lot of stuff coming out about micro beads that people use for face scaring and stuff. So there's all sorts of other things that we need to keep an eye on and be aware of. Um, but that's some of the issues we're getting from there. So yeah, it was affecting the fish behaviour, so they weren't depressed anymore, they were. <laughs> but faecal microbes, this is really what I want to focus on today, um, because it's related to you know, swimming water quality, weightability of water and other things. Um, and the reason we're concerned about those is because of disease, diseases in there. So why are we worried about that? Well, one of the things you need to be aware of is what we call the faecal oral cycle. So this is where um, diseases are spread through water. So we get a, a pathogenic organism that makes us sick, we ingest it, and um, it does all sorts of bad things to our digestive system, and I'm sure you've all experienced it. When you're doing that, you are spreading huge numbers of, of bacteria, um, particularly those disease organisms in your faeces. Um, now normally we wouldn't go near it because talking about shit and faeces is abhorrent, it's not a very nice topic, most people don't like it. Um, but that's because you know, over you know, thousands and thousands or millions of years, humans have learned that there's huge risks associated with that material, so we try and keep away from it. Um, but unfortunately, when it's diluted in water, you often can't see it, and therefore people are likely to come in contact with that. So that's why we're worried about the faecal oral cycle. A lot of diseases in society are spread like that. Um, so what's that got to do with animals? So when I put this slide up, I usually say if there's any Scrabble players out there who want to get lots of points with their Zs, there's a new word for you called zoonoses. Hit the right button there. So that's a name for diseases that we get to share between humans and animals. So as well as having the diseases cycling through the human population, they can also be uh, cycling through the sheep populations. And of course, when we're swimming in the water, um, the bugs don't care where they come from. They're just looking for the next person or animal that they can infect. Some of these diseases, like um, Campylobacter uh, make the humans very sick, don't seem to cause problems in animals, so it's not necessarily an animal health related issue. Some of them though, like Salmonella brandenburg, makes us as humans quite sick. 
Um, and in the sheep, at certain times of pregnancy, they'll cause abortions in the sheep. So huge range of responses in the animal population from those sorts of diseases. What are the types of diseases that we're looking at? This is some data from ESR, work with in Christchurch, um, on a range of diseases. What we've got here, we'll take a little bit of time to go through the slide here. Um, so you might have heard of things like Campylobacter, Salmonella, Cryptosporidium, Estet, that's um, sp specific pathogenic forms of E. coli, um, and Yersinia, a whole range of these diseases. These are the uh, levels, um, rates per 100,000 in the population, so Campylobacter is the highest one we've got there. You know, over 3,000, so over 7,000 cases per year in 2012. Now, most of the medical data would say that that's probably only about 10% of the people who are sick actually go to the doctor. So these are the cases where people have been sick, they've gone to the doctor, they've been confirmed as having that disease. So the real numbers are probably 10 times higher. One of the things that the doctors do in the follow-up from that work is they usually go back and survey the people and ask questions around to try and identify what the drivers of the risk are and where that contamination may have come from. And these are three of the drivers that they're looking at here. And you'll see contact with farm animals. There's a very common uh, risk factor associated with these diseases. Contact with recreational water and a little bit of overseas travel. And with the shigellosis, it's mostly uh, linked with overseas travel. Um, but what we can see here is, um, yep, quite a lot of diseases that are pretty common in, in, in the community, and a lot of it related to animals, particularly in New Zealand. You know, we've got um, you know, only got four and a half million people, but we got. You know, 25 million sheep and 10 million cows out there. So when we're out swimming in our environment or recreating in our environment, or wherever we are, we're more likely to come into microbes from an animal faeces than we are from a human faeces. That's the reality of it. Further to that, that number of Campylobacter at 166 for New Zealand is very good. So going back a decade or so, that number was getting up to the 400s, really, really high. If you look at it, compare it to the UK, uh, twice as high compared to the US, we're still 10 times higher than the US. So that big drop over a previous decade was being driven by a huge amount of effort put into the poultry industry, who were identified as a key driver of Campylobacter. Um, so you might want to have a guess where the remaining 166 cases per year are most likely to be linked to. Ruminant sources. So how do we measure these guys, given that there's so many different species out there that we could be looking at? Well, we use faecal indicator organisms that we use to, to measure them. So historically, we've used total coliforms, faecal coliforms, and faecal streptococci. Nowadays, we use E. coli in the freshwater and enterococci in the marine water. So these are like larger groups of organisms, and as over time, we've kind of refined that to more specific species from here. In the previous presentation, I was really impressed by the fact with biodiversity that you can monitor it by using a camera. It's that simple to measure. That would be so cool. But for microbes, these guys are really small. So here's E. coli here. These are two microns long. So if you made a chain of 500 E. coli from end to end, they would be a millimetre long to give you an idea how small they are. So no, we can't use a camera. We use microscopes and electron micrographs from here. This one here is Campylobacter, which we have a lot of in New Zealand, um, and it's a little spiral-shaped organism. So in two dimensions, it looks like a seagull. Um, but on here, and they've got little um, flagella coming off the tail. You see the E. coli's got little tails coming off the side there, and they just spin them around to help them move in the environment. Um, but that's what they look like. Looking at them under the microscope, you can't really identify what they are because they just look like little round things or little rod-shaped things, and that's it. So we have to do a lot of biochemical tests to work out what the particular organisms are. Um, so then a lot of farmers sort of say to me, okay, so we've got these microbes, okay, are they dairy cows? Yeah, dairy cows, oh, that's good, yeah. Um, anyway, we won't go there. <laughs> um, a lot of farmers, you know, when they start talking about this sort of stuff, they sort of go, you know, what's you know, one cow pat in the river, or one sheep pat, we'll come back to that later, you know, how much of an issue really is it, you know, it's just one of them in a big pile of water. So this is an uh, animation that I use to try and get across to people the impact of one cow pat, because you've got to try and, as well as those microbes being really, really small, you can imagine there's lots and lots of them. So let's try and put some numbers around that. One cow pat can contain approximately a billion E. coli. It's a really big number. It would be nice in your bank account if it had a positive in front of it. 
And that in terms of you know, water quality sort of standards roughly around 100 E. coli and the hundreds of E. coli per mil, that's enough to contaminate a million litres of water. So does anyone want to have a guess at how much a million litres of water is? It's a pretty big concept to get your head around. Oh, what, you want me to carry the mic? Rock and roll style? Okay. <laughs> um, sorry. Um, so we'll help you out from here. One and a half Olympic swimming pools. It's a million litres of water, or um, when I'm talking to dairy audiences, um, 30 Fonterra truck and trailer units would give you about a million litres of white gold. And so one of the impacts of, of that, as well as being a large volume of water that you can contaminate with it, the fact is the smaller the stream, then the bigger the impact that one cow pat will have on there. So one cow pat into the Waikato River at one particular time probably won't have a big issue, but into a small creek, it'll have an impact in terms of the numbers coming out of that small creek. Now, I don't know if I'm going too fast or not, but that was sort of where I wanted to get to in stage one in terms of of um, impacts and why it's important to uh, look at E. coli or look at faecal contamination into water. Right, this slide here will take some time. So this is about what the numbers say. Um, so what I've tried to do is put a whole lot of stuff in one slide to try and give you a flavour of it. So there's a whole series of different water quality standards. So I guess from my you know, studies around quality is around fitness for purpose. So the guidelines or water quality standards, whatever you might have, will vary depending on what purposes you're using the water for. And the outputs here are comp say, complicated by grades and statistics, and I'll go through that a bit more later on. So while I've got just one number down here, some of them are not one number, they're multiple numbers. We'll go through that. So some of the key ones here, you've all heard about primary contact standard and swimmable waters, um, and that's basically around primary contact, it's around heat under the water, so that's when you're getting immersed in the water. And the standards for that are used at the moment like a 95th percentile of lips and 540. Um, the other one is the other one you're hearing a lot about, it's a weightable standard, it's secondary contact standard. This is where you're in contact with the water but not putting your head under. So most of your contamination from uh, secondary contact is around handling the fish, handling fishing lines, putting your hands in the water. And the fundamental difference between these two is purely the volume of water that you are likely to ingest while you're in contact. Of course, it varies a lot with different people, um, but also boating and things like that getting water splashed around. So, I often use the example that when I go kayaking, it's secondary contact because I don't intend getting in the water. But if my daughters come with me, it's primary contact because they intend on getting that in the water. <laughs> um, drinking water standard less than one E. coli per 100 ml. So, basically, none. And even if you could test more than 100 ml, it's still none. So basically you need to have extremely clean water for drinking water standards, uh, which is why we don't really apply them to uh, rivers. Um, shellfish harvesting water, so this is a marine environment. Here we use a slightly different mechanism, a medium of 14 E. coli per 100 mils over about four samples. And then in marine waters, again, for swimmable stuff, they use uh, enterococci values from there. So there's a range of different standards that we use for different purposes of the water. And then I'll go through the, these ones here in a, quite a bit more detail as we go. Standards. Mm. There's probably three different types of words you need to think about. Standards, guidelines and aspirations. So the government came out a while ago with uh, what you call an aspirational goal, all water swimmable in one generation. To me that's an aspirational goal, it's something way out in the future that's really good to aspire to if we can get there and start working towards. The other one is standards and guidelines, and so for the people who work in policy, who uh, keep reminding me of this, there are some subtle differences between the words. So guidelines are guidelines that you can, uh, that are recommended, um, and then standards are something that's absolute. So I guess drinking water is a standard, the water quality, recreational stuff is more guidelines. These are the recommended levels for um, councils to manage to. There's the ANZAC guidelines, which are Australian and New Zealand numbers. Huge big list of document with lots and lots of numbers in there. I'll go through some of those later. Um, well, not in detail, because I don't know all of them myself, but they're related to uh, periphyton growth and biofilms and weedy growth and different um, fish toxicity levels for a whole range of chemicals that you can look up to. 
Then getting into the more meaty stuff that's relevant at the moment, NPS, it's the National Policy Statement for Freshwater, which has anybody in the room not heard of this? Is that your question? I should hope so. Yep. Um, and this is around requires the council to set limits and catchments, and then within that is what they call the NOF, the National Objectives Framework. And this is a framework that is about linking attributes to values, and this is what I'll go through. So the ANZAC guidelines have a whole lot of these attributes in here. So where it's aiming at is you have a value, which might be fishing, so the, the community have a discussion around what water quality they want where. The question then becomes what do you use the water for, what do you value it for, do you value it for fishing? You can't very well kind of set rules and guidelines to say whether the fishing is good or not, it becomes quite arbitrary. So what you need to do is to come up with some numeric attributes that you can measure in the water that indicate that the value might be met. So I'll just use an example from here. You've got fishing, you'll have a concentration of ammonia in the water related to fish toxicity. That might be different where you're looking at a spawning area versus a fishing area. Um, you would also, being a secondary contact sport, you would also have an E. coli attribute value and stuff. And so my understanding about the objectives framework so when the community is having discussions around how to set limits of catchment, that people can say, this is what we value the water for, we want a good quality, fair or poor water quality, and then everybody can pick up the attributes that are sitting in these tables and use them. So that the community is not having an argument about whether how much the nitrate levels or ammonia levels should be. Those figures are already there in some tables to help facilitate that discussion. How do we set these standards? So I mentioned in New Zealand and freshwaters, we use quantitative microbial risk assessment, um, which is a really uh, emerging area of, of mathematical modelling, where you look at the disease risk. So you use Monte Carlo systems. So you know when people go swimming, that there's different people spend different amounts of time in the water, they'll consume different volumes of water. Kids usually drink a lot more water when they're swimming than the adults do. Um, the water can have different levels of contamination in it. So you use a, uh, like a random process with those numbers and run it lots and lots of times to work out the profile of risk and the likelihood of people becoming ill from being in the water. The New Zealand standards that we've got are based on the study from 1998 on uh, to come up with a relationship between E. coli and Campylobacter. So that study said you're most likely to get Campylobacter from water and there was a relationship with the E. coli. So as the E. coli concentrations risk, so does the risk of becoming infected with Campylobacter. That's the New Zealand based data that the freshwater standards are based on. And then we give that a gradient, gradient of low, medium, and high. This is what it looks like. So, this is for starting with secondary contact. Okay, so this is weighable water. This is the one that we have within the uh, national policy statement and national bottom line, I call that, which is no water should be above D, so above 1,000 E. coli per 100 ml. So these are different levels you've got from here. Two important things, one of the infection risks, so the question that was asked earlier from here. So the cutoff point between C and D, so greater than 1,000 is unacceptable. There's a, according to the uh, standards, there's a 5% chance of becoming ill from secondary contact with the water at that level. The other important thing around here is we use a metric to do that measure, which is called a median. So if you look at all the results you get out of a river, you'll get a range of concentrations. Some days will be high, some days will be low, mostly in the middle. And we use the middle value, the median, to set that standard. So what it says, you've got a national bottom line of 1,000, and you're allowed to exceed it half the time. So what does that look like across the country? So this is some data I pulled together a while ago. Um, from a range of sites around New Zealand, you might be able to pick out the shape of the North and South Island if you, unless you're really geographically challenged. Um, you can see the data's um, you know, just come from publicly available stuff from different regional councils. But this is where the standards are. So if we go back, these are the gradings um, A, B, C and D on the chart here. Um, and so the A is blue um, and the B is green from here. So the red dots are the ones that failed. So they're below the national bottom line. There's about 260 points on this graph, and only about 5% of them are failing. So a little bit of work to do to bring that up, but not too problem. 
Then if we start looking at what everyone's talking about, which is swimming water quality, swimmability. A couple of key changes happen this time that are really important to get your head around. The numbers stay the same. We're still looking at these 540 and 260 cutoffs, but the 1,000 disappears. So the D category here, greater than 540, becomes unacceptable. But note that the risk factor is still the same in that 5% cutoff. So in terms of getting ill, because you're in the water longer and, or your head's under the water, you consume, drink more of the water, the chances of getting sick are greater. So we use a different cutoff point from here. And the other thing that takes, changes that makes a really big difference, we're no longer using a median value, but using a 95th percentile. So now only 1 in 20 samples can exceed that standard. Um, and you might guess the map looks a little bit worse. So this is one of the other you know, challenges that people are, that are you know, looking at what we can do around swimmability and whether it's a, an achievable goal or not, is looking at some of the data like this. So about 72% of the sites across those 260 that I had. Now I have to say that not all of those sites will be swimming sites, but a lot of them will. And it might depend on which region where you are. But that's some of the numbers and some of the challenges that we've got. And you will see a lot of those red dots, yep, some of those are in our cities. Some of those might be in our, she in our you know, heavily intensive dairy catchments. But most of you will realise a lot of those are still in your sheep and beef country areas. Richard, are the samples are they reflective of an average across the year, or is it an average across the summer period when it's maybe focused on sports abilities? Yep. The, this data here, is based on the recommended 95th percentile over three years data. And a lot of people are asking questions around shouldn't we just be measuring that when people are swimming and in the water? And I'll show you a slide a couple along where they do just that. But the reality is in most of the data sets, a lot of work that NEWA have done around this, there isn't actually a lot of difference between swimming summer period concentrations and non-summer concentrations. Differences are really small in most sites. Hmm. So, how are we going for time? Here yeah, we good. Go for, you want to see if you can play this video. So this is the Riri, this is the, the um, Riri rock slide at Gisborne, if this works. Just to break it up so you're not listening to me. But this is a research project I'm doing with Gisborne District Council where I have literally immersed myself in the project. Bring the volume yet. Yeah. I was saying immersed myself in the project.
It's enough. Cool. Thank you. Right. Thought I'd show you that. Um, it was a really well made clip actually. And um, so as I said, yeah, I've been immersed in myself. And the day I went, um, there was nowhere near that number of people at the uh, rock slide. Um, but Gisborne District Council provide, kindly provided me with a bodyboard. And um, I guess it was quite cold, which is why no one else was there. Um, but this is in, in um, steep hill country, up in the Riri Furukopai catchment. Um, we're talking majority class five and six farmland up there. Um, and this swimming site is listed in the AA magazine, 101 top things to do in New Zealand. And it doesn't meet swimming water quality standards. But you can see how much use it gets. It gets absolutely packed through summertime. It's a really important part of the community. People will drive two hours to get to the catchment to go and have a play on, on the rock slide from there. So this is you know, a case where it's really hitting home for them. And so we've got a project running there, uh, funded by a ministry for the environment, helping them out on um, some modelling stuff. So look at the stuff, um, look at the data from that side. This is the data from a number of years where, as Janet pointed out, they've been just monitoring through the summer period. You can see the block of dots as you go every year. That red line is the, the swimming standard. And so if, remember for that 95th percentile, in theory one in 20 dots are allowed to be above that line. But as you can see, we're significantly above the line. And some of the work we've done with, with NIWA um, you know, around national studies looking at the swimming stuff, it's not just, we're not just slightly over the numbers. At a lot of places, we're four and five times above the standards. Um, so that's some of the real challenges you've got. The other thing that's really important, probably for this one before you, is what they decided to do in, in 2016 was start monitoring continuously. And the numbers started dropping really dramatically. And they thought, oh, great, maybe the problem's going away. And it's like, well, you haven't monitored any other winter, so we've got nothing to compare this to. And um, I haven't managed to catch up with any more recent data from here, but I suspect it will have come back up again in the summertime. Um, so yeah, that was, that was it. You know, it's, you know, some real challenges. A lot of it sits in the sheep and beef industries, and that's you know, just one example of a place where, um, I guess a lot of stuff around the environment is around um, sensitivity of the environment. So sheep and beef farming, hill country stuff, is very low intensity. It has very low nutrient losses, but if you've got a sensitive environment, it still has an impact. That's the, I guess, one of the real challenges facing the sheep and beef industry. So current knowledge, this is going to be quite brief. Um, <laughs> and I'm not joking. Um, so fen fencing's like a really important mitigation that we've got. And since we've been asked the question around sort of buffer strips as well at the moment, did my PhD on that whole area of, of grass setbacks and trapping efficiency of bugs. And there's a whole lot of complications in there. So at the moment I say fencing is important because it's keeping the animals out of the stream. And in terms of the modelling work I do, whether you put a buffer strip there or not, I don't take any account of that. Just the fact you're keeping the animals out of the stream. That's the effect of the, of the fencing. When you do that, of course, you need to put bridges and things like that in as well. Um, the challenges around when the impact is occurring. So we've got time. So when I did some initial stuff on how much an animal craps in a stream directly, and if you do that on an annual basis like you would an overseer model that gives you an annual nitri nitrate leaching losses or whatever, it comes up with about 1% of your E. coli load per year comes from animals crapping in the stream. So you go, well, what's the point of putting up a fence from that? But what you need to understand is that with microbes, in terms of storm events that we heard about earlier, you get a massive wash off of microbes coming from the paddock, from the soils, from the feces from there, and the numbers go through the roof. So on an annual basis, most of the coli loads in those storms, which if you've got a short enough catchment, go through there rapidly. But the cows cramping on the stream have an impact under the low flow conditions when people are swimming and likely to use the the river under base flow conditions. So that's one of the challenges from that. So then if you look at the setback differences of a buffer strip, um, they only work when it's raining. The fence keeps the cows out when it's fine and your river's under low flow conditions when you want to use them. So I use a rule of thumb, base flow, in terms of low flows in the river, is when people want to use the river as a recreational source for fishing, for um, kayaking, swimming, whatever. The high flows are important for where the river discharges because you don't go fishing when the river's high, you don't go swimming when the river's high. But it's where those plumes of, of that river water discharge, if it goes into the ocean, 
in most places in New Zealand we have really rapid mixing in our, um, in our marine environment which quickly disperse it, but if it's going into a lake um, then you will have you know, pollution inputs and you will have seen the sediment plume that comes out from rivers from there. So that's some of the challenges from there and what I showed with my work in my PhD on buffer strips that when you get a heavy rainfall event, which is when most of the E. coli are moving, they go straight through the buffer strip. Because they're so small they act like a dissolved nutrient, uh, nutrient in the water and they go over the top. So there are other mechanisms by which having a setback and a buffer and planting it may help from there, but the key message I usually sort of say, buffer strips and riparian planting is great for stabilising stream banks, for sediment control, for biodiversity, for all of those other reasons. Keep doing them, put them in, but in terms of mathematical modelling, I can't say that they can reduce the coal loads. But they're still a really valuable part of the whole farm environment. Now the other one I've got there is flood versus spray irrigation. So where I grew up in Winchmore we had flood irrigation. Um, and still other parts of Southland slowly getting converted to spray irrigation now, but huge numbers of E. coli losses coming off from there. <coughs> other tools that we have, so ESR have been developing a range of faecal source tracking tools which they can use to identify cattle, sheep and birds. Um, obviously human sources as well, um, so you can take samples from there. Uh, the Riri catchment where we've got, they've done faecal source tracking work um, a couple of times, they're doing another batch now I think, but keeps coming up with ruminant sources um, for, for the contamination in the Riri, so we can't be blaming the birds up there. Um, other tools that we've got, so modelling tools, there's clues, catchment, land use and economic sustainability model developed by NIWA and MPI um, with Ag Research as well, so a big, big catchment scale, broad brush model. Um, it's the best we got in the country, um, but as was put very adequately earlier, it's still a very crude tool in terms of the numbers that are behind it. There's a risk index approach, which is some of the stuff I'm doing. So I do really complicated um, Monte Carlo simulations, statistical modelling. Um, it's great as a research tool, but it's not very helpful for farmers and people on the ground. So what I do is develop a much simplified version of that, which I call a risk index, which takes all that risk things and comes up with a single risk value and all it's really doing is trying to identify on your farm what's your biggest risk so that you know which thing to do first, which thing to do second, um, hopefully around that. And then the rumour hunger model, so I work with John Diamond from Landcare and he's got a specific model um, which has some functionality in the rumour hunger catchment which was quite interesting to do. That was looking at storm flow, the risk index is looking at base flow only because that's the biggest issue that I see. Um, and there's a clues model as well. But I guess the other thing for me, I focus my work a lot on base flow conditions in New Zealand because if you go overseas, um, the real eye opener for me a decade or so ago to go to the UK and sort of say, um, they don't have the same cultural values that we do of wanting to swim in their rivers. Probably because for generations the rivers have been so polluted that no one actually swims in the rivers. Um, Elaine Moriarty, who some of you might know from ESR, who does a lot of work with us as well in this space, you know, she just thinks it's crazy swimming in freshwater, you swim in the ocean because that's what you do coming from Ireland. So um, you know, New Zealand has some really um, you know, unique as aspects to this work and also, so a lot of my collaborators I work with in the US, they're spending millions of dollars developing storm based models and stuff like that, so why replicate what they're doing with my money in New Zealand, let's focus on what we're doing here and I'll steal the storm based model stuff from them. And they're quite happy, it's called collaboration in science, not stealing. So that's some of the tools that we have from there. The Rary Rock Slide project. So this is um, working with a community of farmers, Gisborne District Council and MFE up there. What we're looking at is the cost effectiveness of fencing um, in, in that country, which is really steep. One of the things that was really good to be able to do at the project was they, like, to, to go up there, because I'm not from a steep country, to actually go up there, get on a four-wheel motorbike or those LAVs or whatever they are, with the farmers and actually drive around the farm and look at their streams and look at the country and they say, hey, this is too hard to fence and you go and look at it and you go, well, it blimmin' well is, you know. And it's really steep as well. So some of the questions we're asking here in this, in this project is around sheep fences are more expensive than cow fences. Um, sheep crap in the streams a little bit less than the cows do. So therefore, you know, it's probably more cost effective to just keep the cows out. But when you've got slope factors in there as well, it gets more and more expensive as you go up the hills. So one of the things I want to try and work out 
is it might actually be cheaper and more effective to fence the sheep out on the flat and not the cows on the hill. You know? What's the trade-off from that? And then in terms of your die-off questions, because you might have a distance from the stream across the flat land, there is a little bit of flats in the valleys, um, and then go up the hills, you know, what's the die-off from there, from that hill country that might be affecting those things? So I'm really pushing the boat, because that's what they want me to do, in terms of pushing where the science is going. Um, it's really stretching our knowledge, but it's some really good questions to be asking about how that varies. And then the other questions around, well, if we're putting in those bridges, what about other costs of putting bridges in or culverts in there or alternative water supplies that they have to do in this country. So that's some of the you know, really grappling with where those really gnarly issues. Knowledge gaps that we've got, just a small number of them. Um, so alternatives to fencing in some of this really steep country, um, if that's an issue. Oh, one of the things I should say in the Gisborne I'm looking at as well is trying to see if we can work out the profitability of removing the cattle. It may actually work out to be more cost effective to take the cattle off the farm because they crap on the stream more and reduce your profit a little bit, but that might be cheaper than trying to put cattle fencing everywhere. I don't know. You know and some of the key questions we have to work through with the farmers is what's the <coughs> implications for their farm systems and for grazing management and everything else by not having cows in that country. Um, yeah, so alternatives, water supplies, um, some of the questions I've got, you know, the questions around biodiversity from here, I think about you know, what effect would planting have. So some of these gullies that we look at are really steep and there's a lot of native vegetation in there anyway. Is that enough to keep the sheep out? I know at Indermay or in, um, where we are, you know, the sheep go to the willows and stuff that might be near the stream. So sometimes the effect of trees might draw the animals in, sometimes it might keep them out. Um, and also partial fencing. So you can see, and if you look up these rivers, hot spots, areas where the animals access the river a lot. What if you just fenced those bits, would that be, an, and provided a water course, you might be able to pay 10% of your fencing costs and still have the majority of the benefit. I don't know, but there's, um, I certainly know with work we've done on deer for years that if you fence off a deer wallow, they'll just go and build another one. So you can't just, if you just put a fence up, if they go and drink in the next bit above the fence, there's not much point. So there's a lot of practical questions around it. Wetlands goes back to the question earlier around um, sediment traps and things like that. Um, e. coli numbers can increase through wetlands because they bring in birds and stuff like that as well um, and other effects of the hydrology through wetlands. So there's a lot of unknowns around that. Um, buffer strips, we've already talked about that one in detail. Um, the other stuff is around modelling. To be honest, there's some really big gaps around the sheep and beef industry in terms of understanding from that. So I've only been you know, doing work um, doing measurements for the last couple of years on sheep and beef farms up until then it was all on the dairy industry um, and big gaps in terms of runoff we talked about rainfall events and what happens in those events and how that impacts the whole catchment and the other one is funding so time wise how are we doing yeah. five to five, two. Um, so just as a really quick overview if you're going to write an MB program like I'm doing at the moment, which is due in early in March, you should be able to put it all on one slide. So this is a whole, hopefully, eight and a half million dollar research program over five years in one slide. <laughs> Piece of cake. Um, but really, there's about four main objectives in here. One is around accounting for sources and their health risks. So we've talked today about some of these sources that we've got, but we don't. In terms of the national policy statement, it requires the regional councils to account for and manage sources. But in terms of microbiology, we don't actually know enough about these sources, and particularly around horticultural land and stuff like that. So what we need is a lot more data on these different sources, fecal source tracking tools so we can identify them in the water, and also understanding what's the relative health risk of a septic tank versus arable horticultural land use impact in terms of actually making people sick. But some of the science where you know, internationally the work is going and driving there, the tools are now available for us to do it, we just need the resources to be able to move into that space. So that's about accounting for it. Second two is around attenuation. This is this whole upstream, downstream effect of microbes. That's you know, how far upstream do we need to manage. Mitigation options, I've shown you guys fencing. That really is the only model we've got at the moment, and even then it's pretty coarse in terms of how effective it's going to be. So we need some more options around ponds and, and treatment systems that may be better. And the other one, um, is around cultural and social acceptability of these practices as well for Māori communities from there. Um, and I think that's really important because we don't want to be developing 
um, you know, putting some chemicals into a farm dairy effluent pond, yeah, it might get the E. coli, but if we don't want the discharge in the river, that's not appropriate. Same thing with human sewage. If, um, yeah, if it's not, not acceptable to be having that human sewage going into a river, it doesn't matter how well you treat it, it doesn't matter how far upstream it is, it's not acceptable. Well, that's some of the stuff we need to be thinking about and communicating at, at a community level. And the outcomes from there, we've talked a lot about swimming because that's one of our main focuses. Um, but again, these waters, as well as being used for swimming, the hangakai, the shellfish gathering stuff downstream, the commercial stuff, um, but also a lot of recreational gathering, and also drinking water takes. Um, it's been alluded to, Havelock um, North, and also Darfield a number of years ago. These are drinking water outbakes that come from sheep and beef sources of faecal material. So, um, and the last thing I have to say, I apologise I can't stay over lunch because I'm going into MFE and MPI to talk about this program with them today. <laughs> um, but I do hope to, hope to be back in time by the end of the conference. So if anyone wants to sort of ask questions around sheep and beef industry, what you guys want to do or can do in relation to that, either chat to Matt because I'll share the flight with him back to Dunedin tonight and we can catch up, or I'll come back around 3 o'clock this afternoon and I'm happy to stay and chat to people then because I'm not flying out till about shouldn't say seven, but yes, seven. <laughs> okay. So thank you.